So I'm gonna go ahead and let you turn if you want. Uh, there'll be several passages of scripture this evening and we'll get to it in a little bit. We're gonna be in 2 Kings just for a little bit, chapter three. Uh, but before we get there, I kind of want to set the stage a little bit and I want to talk to you about distractions. Does anybody ever deal with distractions? And, um, and they happen. You realize that if you, if you mess around with a distraction long enough, uh, that it can become a detour away from faith, away from spiritual things. Uh, if you stare at a distraction too long or you play with it too long, it can actually become a stumbling block. And so we need to recognize those things and look after them. So really let me set the stage for you uh, right here in 2 Kings chapter three. And it's actually, uh, Elisha is now the prophet. Uh, Elijah has, uh, is gone and Elisha has come on the scene. And during this time up to this, these three chapters, he's, he's been on a walk. He's been made fun of. Uh, he's been ridiculed by those in different towns. Uh, not so much, uh, but they recognize who he is as God's man, but more of their unbelief and their lack of faith. Uh, now he, here we are in chapter three, and it is, excuse me, Jehoram king of Israel and the king of Edom called for the king of Judah. I know that's a big mouthful. Uh, and the king of Judah is Jehoshaphat, and he is the only one of faith of the bunch, and they want his help because the king of Moab uh, has quit paying tributes uh, to the king of Israel. It, it sounds like an episode of The Sopranos, doesn't it, uh, when we look at it from that standpoint. And, and just to give you kind of what's happening, if you think about it, and this is not a political sermon, but the kingdom has split, if you go back and study it, as after Solomon had passed and the building of the temple and things got a little bit costly and they began to raise taxes and it began to hurt people, then there began to be a rebellion and then all of a sudden the kingdom split into two and you've got the northern 10 tribes and part of the tribe of Benjamin uh, that would stand against the tribe of Judah and what was left of Benjamin, those two tribes, and there is where the uh, lineage of faith would reside. So, and, and I say all of that because uh, as they, king of Israel, king of Edom, are gonna go to war and they need some help, and obviously they call on King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat's like, hey, great, I'll go. Uh, logistically, I think it's a failure because then all of a sudden they find themselves out in the middle of a desert and the horses are tired and they're tired and there's no water and they realize that if we don't get some help, we're gonna lose. And so if you think about all of that, uh, they start asking questions. Is there not anybody that can call on the Lord? And so the sinful king of Israel actually has somebody in his entourage that mentions there's a man uh, and I love this translation, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And, and it just meant one who served Elijah and learned from Elijah and poured his life into it and into the Lord. And now Elijah's gone and he's here and, and, and they called his name and Jehoshaphat's like, yeah, I know him. He knows the Lord. And so when that happens, now they go to get his attention. And, uh, and that's where I think it becomes good because here is Elisha, excuse me, and uh, I want you to put yourself kind of in his place. So you see all these things that are going on in the kingdom. You're God's man, and there's a lot of stress, and it can be distractions, and it's even, as much as we don't want it to be, it's political in nature, because you've got Judah, king of Judah, trying to help him, Jehoshaphat, who is a man of faith, who is aligning himself with two other kings that have no faith, and... Is that any different than what we live in today? When you cut the news, anybody watch the news in the morning? I mean, just the local news maybe? Anybody veg out on Fox News all day? Stress you out any? Uh, it's not a political statement. I mean, it depends on which side you lean. It's shock value for the right, and there's other stations that are shock value to the left, and are any of them telling you the truth? And the only truth is in Christ. So I say that because there's a great answer. And during all of that, when they go find Elisha, and I'm, I'm kind of summarizing all this, and you can go into three and get it. And, and it's a beautiful statement, and I admire him for it because you sense some frustration, and they're telling him what they want. 
And his answer to them, and especially to Jehoram, the king of Israel, is like, why don't you go call on the pagan gods and prophets of your mom and dad if you want an answer? And his response is, is that the Lord put them together. So it's not that he doesn't believe, he's just simply rebellious and sinful. And, uh, and, and so when he hears that, and, and Elisha's response to him is the only, I wouldn't even talk to you except for I have respect for Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. And so this is where I wanna start because I wanna talk about things that can be a distraction. And those are the things that you just heard. Regardless if it's a political time of the year, think about something that you're dealing with in your life that keeps arising, that you pray about, that draws your attention away from your faith. But in 2 Kings chapter 3, 15, this is Elisha's response. He says, but now bring me a harpist. While the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. And you can read on later from there because what happened after that is he had a word of the Lord and he told them and it, uh, go out in the middle of this desert and start digging trenches. And it wasn't going to rain, but they were going to fill with water. And so, and that's a completely another sermon because when the Lord tells you to do something, sometimes there's a response and that you need to actually walk it out and go do something. And, uh, but we see, and it happens and he gives them the instruction and they win and it's great and everything's good. But what I want you to understand is when you go back and study, if you look at this and you hear the tone that Elisha has, uh, we talk about a distraction. A distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. It's simple. You're not gonna avoid distractions. They're gonna happen in your life continually. But there's another part of that. Maybe you've been there. Got any role players in here? I mean, when something happens, uh, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I'm one of those people uh, by nature. Wife's drinking some water so I don't see her laughing. Uh, she can talk me off the edge real easy. Uh, but in my training as a Marine, as a, as a trooper, uh, it was always role-playing because it was a part of safety. Uh, if they do this, I'll do that. And what happens if I go here? The only problem is, how do you cut that off? Because something, somebody could call you and need you and it's a 20-minute drive from here and you're a mess by the time you get there and didn't have anything to do with what you were thinking about. You'd worked it out eight different ways and you were going to win I mean, do you know what I'm talking about? Does anybody ever deal with those things and it creates an angst or it really can create an anxiety in you? And I say that because you're like, well, is that really a distraction? Well, if you pull up distraction, what I just read to you was the answer to it, but it also says it's something that causes extreme agitation of the mind and the emotion. So if we look at it from that standpoint, not only does it keep you from giving full attention to something else, but it will take your attention until it creates an agitation of your mind and your emotion. Have you ever been there? And so when we see it from that standpoint, now let's look at Elisha who has went ahead and uh, I just say a man's man because he sat there in front of three kings and told them exactly what was on his mind and how he felt about the king of Israel and his family. And then realizes that Jehoshaphat's there and he does have respect for him and they need an answer. So how many times have you went to the Lord to get an answer, but you keep looking back at the distraction? But what he does is he calls for a harp and we look at that as a place of worship because it's the minute that he could take his mind because he was God's man or he was faithful and he could begin to to turn towards the Lord and factor out everything that was around him because the distraction in essence, when you look at that, it's the music of the harp that helped helped seal off all outside distraction of unbelief around him and bring him into the frame of mind or to have the mindset to reach out in the spirit and to receive the Lord's revelation. And so that's something that we should do all the time. And so when we look at it, because we're going to walk in and out of distractions in this life. And so when I titled this, I was like, you know, bypassing distractions. We can bypass that as we walk with the Lord and we have the, the right mindset. Because I say bypass, you're not avoiding. It's always going to be there. 
So let me help you as we move through this. Isaiah 26, three. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. And when you look at perfect peace or a matured peace, a, a, it's a peace that, you can, that can grow in you and you grow with. That comes from spending time with the Lord because it says whose minds are steadfast. So let's break steadfast down real quickly. It's resolute and it's dutiful, which means if I am steadfast, it has a purpose, that it is resolute, it is definite. It means it is firm and it is unwavering. See, when it's unwavering, that's the type of faith that we're talking about or the mindset is I'm not gonna change my mind because I'm being distracted by unbelief or what I've been around or actually have found myself in line with. How many own your job? I'm gonna move out of this light just for a second. That if you look at everything that maybe where you work, of those that, that you have to maybe either report to or that you are in line with, doesn't mean that you agree, but, but you're not gonna be able to avoid and they're not a believer. They may even mock your faith. May not do it to your face, but they may mock faith in general. And, and, and the reason I say that because you're there for a purpose. Have you ever thought about yourself as being, be, you're the one that's there for a reason because of your relationship with the Lord? That when things become so distracting that somebody needs to be able to pull away and call upon the Lord. But now what we see, what happens with Elisha, and I love it, it's real simple. It's a short verse, but he, so bring, in another translation, bring me somebody that can play a harp. It may be, it's like, bring me someone that can sing. That means bring Matt or somebody from his team. Don't bring Pastor Gray. I need somebody that can keep my mind focused on the Lord. But that's in essence what he's talking about, is I've got to get to a place that drowns out the distraction so that unbelief and so that fear does not affect me, that I might hear and hear correctly. And that when I hear, I can repeat and I can respond. And that is where God is faithful and he's always faithful. We just sang those songs in worship, and, and, and I can tell you right now that, that, that Jesus has never lost a battle and he's never failed to be faithful. And so that being the case, is if we're gonna, as Isaiah would say, remain steadfast, unwavering, and dutiful, it will bring peace to your mind, and it's for those that trust in the Lord. Psalm 22, verse five. It said, to you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. Psalm 28, seven. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song I praise him. The reason that we're going through these is because I wanna to get to a place that you understand that when you face a distraction or something rises up or a situation you're involved in, and it, and it could be something with your health, it could be relationship, that you sit and listen to people tell you everything that's wrong or a doctor of everything maybe that you're facing and that you don't get so caught up in what you're hearing that you lose track of who you are in Christ. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. And I love this when Paul talks, he says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. That's, and that's Paul saying, you were taught and I wasn't afraid to call out your former way of life and try to teach you in a way to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now I want you to think about that. Made new in the attitude of your mind or your mindset. 
Could a change of attitude move us from doubt, fear, complaint in any situation to a mindset that sees what you're dealing with as an opportunity? And whose will and power is it to, it's yours to change your mind. Is it not? If you go back and you read the Psalms, uh, I, I, I was talking with somebody that says, well, you know, well, those things aren't in, in, in chrono right order or chronological order, or how he wrote them. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I have a little education. I'm not as learned as some, but I thought it's pretty simple. I said, well, you know what? But it's in the order that the Holy Spirit wanted. So what difference does it make? Not that I would argue with you. Uh, yes, you are right. However, I'd rather lean on what the Holy Spirit has. And, and, and in Psalm 8, and it's not up there, we have this, there's a great verse that, that, that just says this question, man, man, who is man that you're mindful of him? And just ascribing all this wonderful worth. But if you go back uh, to actually Psalm 7 and see at the end of Psalm 7, when he's talking about it, he's been through some battles and he's had to deal with some situations. And at the very end of it, he says, I will praise the Lord. And it's in a situation that not so much that you would want to praise the Lord, but as an act of his will, because he knew the mindset that he needed to keep King David. He says, I will as an act of my will, regardless or in spite of anything that's happening, praise the Lord. And that's something that can't be taken from you. That's the authority and the power that you have in your life through the Holy Spirit that resides in you, that any distraction that comes your way does not have to be so big and bad that it draws your attention 24-7 that you can't steal away and say, as an act of my will that the Holy Spirit has given me, I'm going to praise the Lord and bring back my mindset that can be fruitful in Christ that I might hear what he has to say. And that's what begins to change the atmosphere around you. And I say that because in spite of circumstances that may not change, I thought about this and I didn't put it in my notes, but I, because sometimes, I'll be honest with you, these poor old pastors that work with me, I say poor old pastors, Jonathan, Pastor Stephen, I, I know he's not on staff, but he's still here, so unfortunately he does get phone calls from me occasionally, and uh, David and Sergio, I will bounce things off of them. What do you think about that? Can I say that? Can I get away with that? Is it gonna be okay? Uh, because sometimes my vocabulary may be a little bit too straightforward. And when you look at it from an aspect and you realize that if you look at your situation and we talk about the atmosphere changing around you, I'm talking about the presence, I'm talking about the anointing of the, the Lord that comes upon you. And just because your situation does not change instantaneously does not mean that God is not faithful and that you're not hearing from him. Because if all of you're worried about is your comfort and how you feel, then I, then I think that you need to back up a little bit and you need to reassess your relationship and begin to see that God's faithful regardless of what we're going through or how we feel. And we live in a land of distraction. I've told you this before, I'll share it real quickly. One of the first mission trips, uh, well it was my first, Pastor Keith took us, it took me in March of 2002, and we were in Belize, and, uh, and actually saw this two children healed, and one's back was just really bent, like an S, and he hopped, he just strays aboard. Shingle stayed on the church, and windows didn't get blowed out, and they just prayed, and it happened, and I was like, oh my goodness. Another small child, foot was healed and they're just praying, praising the Lord. I'm kind of sick. No sound comes out of your mouth. Uh, have you ever, and I, and I wasn't afraid. I was just, I guess, shocked. I don't know. Have you ever been when you were young, you ever been afraid and you tried to yell, no sound come out? You know, it was that kind of thing. I, I remember looking at Keith and, and he's weeping. And I'm getting a hold, of, his name was Mike Figueroa. He was down at Living Word and he was, 
Hispanic pastor, and I, and I, I remember him I got grabbing him because the one foot was really swollen. The blade of that child's foot was dark, and, and, and it just quivered, and I saw an arch, and I thought, whew. I said, did that, that foot got an arch on it? And he took his pen out and just laid against it. And I'm telling you, it wasn't one of these people falling out or nothing, and I was kind of sick and uh, felt challenged. And I'm, and, and I'm praying. I don't understand. And I'm, I don't get it. I'm talking to that pastor. I'm like, hey, this, tell him what I, he said, oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> oh, that just happens all the time. Sick come in, get prayed for, they're healed. Wait a minute, I think I read that somewhere. And, I, and, I'm thinking, and, and he starts telling me what, that they, what they need with their schools, the, the substance abuse that has plagued because the jobs were gone and, I, and, and stuff with help with that. And I thought, wow, everything that he says he needs, he has help, we have it back at home. But the thing that I'm seeing right now that I only see occasionally, and Lord, I don't understand it. I, I'm Pentecostal, Lord, I, I'm, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. And, I'm, and then you feel like, who am I telling? You know that. And I don't understand. And the Lord was very gentle and quick. And it was, but these people love me. And I thought, but I love you. And he said, but you have everything that you have need of at your hand. And these people don't have anything. And in spite of that, they love me. And it taught me something. That in spite of the distractions that go on or the things that they're up against, that when they came together in the Lord, that they had a mindset of I'm gonna praise him in spite of what I'm facing because he is worthy. And, and, and so we're closing. You see, because a mindset that sees opportunity, it may be the very thing in the verse in Romans we're going to read from 12.2 that you've read I know many times that takes us a little bit deeper and reveals a greater purpose in Romans 12.2 says don't conform to the pattern of this world. See, as a believer, don't do things like this world does it. You don't have to get in line with the world. It says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to test and approve what, is God, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And see, that's, that, that, that's when we reach a place to where, regardless of the distraction, that we can go to him, and it, and it blocks that out, and our mindset and focus is on him, period. And in doing that, can take you to a place where he reveals what his approved will is, good and acceptable. And sometimes it may not be in line with your wants, but it is true, and it is holy, and it's what he says, and it's what we walk in. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, don't forget that, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And if we could take that deeper than just on the surface peace, and I feel okay, and I've cried it out, and I'm better now, that when the peace of God begins to fall upon you, which transcends all understanding, if it's gonna guard your heart and your mind, it's gonna bring you to a mindset that in spite of what you're looking at, that when you see it, you see that you're walking with him. And if it doesn't change that very moment or instantaneously, it doesn't matter because God has spoken and I have peace and I can walk with him because he is the one that upholds me and he is the one that guides me and everything's gonna be okay. It's amazing that when that peace falls, it transcends understanding. It doesn't say he's gonna make everything okay and give you just what you need. It says no, he's gonna guard your heart and your mind so that you don't fall back in doubt and fear and unbelief. Verse 
last one, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. I wrestled with putting this in here, but the more I studied this, the more everything that our senior pastor, uh, Keith, has preached for these last weeks on the armor of God. It, I hope you've not missed any of those on Sundays, and if you have, go back and I listen to them because they are incredible, uh, and there's just so much depth to it. Um, and I thought about this when I looked at this, and I said, this is New Covenant. And I thought, here's Elisha in the Old Covenant. And he sees all the political turmoil, the unbelief, the sin. He's calling it out. He's living. He's doing what God does. He comes in. He speaks his mind. And he has to call for a harp to get his mind back to where he knows if he can focus on the Lord that if I can just, I need to focus on the Lord. And I looked at this, and it, and it was a little bit different light. It said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's every distraction you'll ever encounter. And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I use the New King James there. I read a lot. New Living, NIV, Amplified. And the reason I use this because it says bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, some of those says, you know, you take those thoughts and make them obedient. How's that working for you? You might win one or two. But out of 10, and the only reason I say that is it's the obedience of Christ that we rest in. If you go back and study, well, I know we read Philippians 4, but Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus humbled himself and came obedient to the point of death. Death on the cross. That's where he said that he, he didn't think that being equality with, with God because he, he is the very nature of God was anything to grasp. And what he's saying is that everything that I am that you will see because you trust in me and my gift on the cross, you'll be with me one day and you'll see me as I am. That I gave all that up to come down and to live and to be like you. I didn't see that that was anything to hold on to other than to come down and be with you and be like you. And when you're having a bad day and your mind's running away with you and you can't control it and every distraction rises up and you're looking for a harp or somebody that can sing or anything that you can to get your mind back into control where you can focus on the Lord, that I have humbled myself before the death, death on the cross, so that when you come up against it, that all that you would need to do, if you want to bring it into the obedience of me, that's what Christ is saying, that what I did on the cross, it's all of a sudden now it becomes a lie. It's not me. I don't have to contend with Satan. I can't overcome him. I look at everything and how thing it comes against me. It's Christ and his obedience on the cross. It's his death on the cross and his resurrection, the finished work when he said it's done. Everything that you have need of is now finished. If you would only focus on on the finished work of the cross, that when that is lifted up and I am lifted up, there is nothing that's in your mind or coming against you that I can't make obedient to me. Because when you read that in Philippians 2, it says because he did that, that God so loved it, he exalted him to a high place that every knee would bow and every tongue's gonna confess that he's Lord. I didn't come to yell at you. <laughs> But go ahead and stand to your feet. Because what I want you to get a hold of, man, I, I, I'm, I'm 
my uncle's pastor back in my hometown of Mount Airy. I say Mount Airy, hometown. I lived here longer than I lived there. Uh, I told him the other day that, uh, you know, I look in Scripture and what's been fulfilled in Christ and what's happening. He said, I'm not watching anymore. I'm listening. I'm listening. So let's just bow our heads. I don't know what you're up against. I don't know what distractions have took your attention. And maybe you're here and you be honest and nobody's looking around and you say, you know what? There's things I can't control. It's gonna be there regardless, these distractions. And I've got so focused on it that a lot of times, Gray, I struggle to just get in the right mindset in order to hear from the Lord. It's just a struggle. If that's you, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I want you to slip your hand up. I just wanna see who you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There's only one bypass that leads to peace and a right resolution. And that's the presence of God. We trust in His obedience to bring us to a place that we see Him high and lifted up. So if you want to come down and, and we can pray together and we... We can do it in song. I mean, Elisha, he called for a harpist. So if you'd like to come down and we pray collectively, and the reason I say we come down, because some people, you know, raise their hand and sometimes the biggest stumbling block is, I don't want to have to step across people to get there. But if we came together, man, what support we have. So what's your harp? Has it been a while since you used it? If it has, I just wanted to invite you up for a few moments. Pastor Matt's gonna lead us in worship as we pray. Come on, can we sing this? Just lift up your hands and let's sing this saying. A perfect submission. All is at rest. All is at rest. I know, I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps. So this is my story, and this is my song. I'm praising my risen King and Savior. All the day long And we say tonight That I trust in God My Savior The one We trust you Lord Who will never fail He will never fail My Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Come on, say that again. I and I trust in God, my Savior, my Savior. My Savior, the one who will never fail, he will never fail. Say, I sought the Lord, and I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought 
sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. That's why I trust Him. Come on, say it again. Lift your hands, say it. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord and He heard and He answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered that's why I trust him that's why I trust in God say that my Savior the one who will never who will never never he will never fail and I trust in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail Praise the Lord. And as we're getting ready to go, I asked you something earlier about, you know, what's your harp? We're, we're blessed here. I'm telling you, we, we have a, a lot of people who are so gifted in worship. And uh, I, I told Matt today, it's not so much that uh, it, it would never be a, a knock on that. But I say, what, what's your harp? Because for me, I've, I've, I've never, I'll tell you if, if what my struggles are, um, is I, I have to walk through this. I know sometimes you wonder, it's like, man, every time Gray's up there, he just used the Bible. Uh, it just lays out all these scripture. And, and, and the reason that I do that is uh, uh, I learned a valuable lesson long ago. Sometimes people will just take a passage of scripture and want to pull it out and shake it like it's supposed to do something and it doesn't. And bend it and twist it and whatever and make it look at their need but if you see, see that's my harp if you you find something and God speaks to you he does it for a purpose and it's you, you, you can begin to read open it turn the page hear it I know that sounds old school but I like to hear the pages and, and if you can begin to walk it out I mean even from the old covenant when I get to the old covenant I call Stephen and he'll over our laugh about it but I'm serious because I have found that uh, Keith will do it some, Stephen likes to do it a lot, and it's not on purpose, but uh, but have you considered or, or, or have you thought? And, you know, with everything that would rise up, but it, you know, you're challenged. Uh, but it, it brings you back to this word, and then you begin to walk it out. And then you begin to see that, wow, man, Christ has presented himself from front to back. And if you let him begin to speak to you, these are the things that begin to sink deep into the, the soulish part of you that can be called upon when you do face distraction. And that you begin to hear, Keith mentioned it in the other sermon when he talked about, and I'm not gonna get into this in depth, but he talked about the armory that was in you. He's talking about the word. He was talking about whether it was the Lagos or a Rama, the, the small sword, and, uh, um, and how the Holy Spirit can take the word and begin to use it, but how that armory was there. <clears throat> and, and that's what sometimes, if you don't understand those terminology, if you were in the military, uh, or when I, I was in the Marine Corps, I can't talk about the other guys, but I know they're similar, or the ground pounders are, is uh, that the only way that I could be allowed to check out my weapon 
is that I had to be very familiar with the weapon. And if something ever happened to the weapon, because the weapon's perfect. And, and normally the, the, what was wrong with the weapon wasn't the weapon, it was one operating the weapon. But the one who issued the weapon was the weapon's master. See, he's the armory. He's the armorer. And so you have, a, you have the armorer residing in the armory of your soul as the Holy Spirit. And there's, there's not a weapon formed against you that he can't overcome or handle because he is the master of the weapons. And he's the one that, it, but the only way you're ever gonna get familiar with the weapons that, that you need to use are when you begin to walk through this and crack it open. So if it's not a part of your instruments, let it become a part of it, that when you sing worship, you can sing the word. And, it, if, and if you ever notice, if you ever begin to pray the word and pray in the spirit, that if you sing in a language you understand, but you begin to sing in the spirit, you're, you're singing the word. And if you'll begin to do those things, I'm telling you, the distractions will not overtake you. Lord bless you. Thank you for your time. And y'all have a good evening.